Welcome to episode three of Bedroom Forensics. Please subscribe to my channel and you can get all of the latest episodes as soon as they come online. Now today's episode is all about types of evidence. That's anything that's found at a crime scene. And now each of these will get its own episode, so don't you fret. We can't cover it all in one. This is just Forensics 101, remember. So let's start with types of evidence that we're gonna find. So there's trace evidence. That means fibers, hair, glass, and paint chips. Now the importance of trace evidence can be critical to an investigation. Photographing the area where any evidence is collected not only provides a documentation of the collection, but also assists in locating trace evidence. Biological evidence, that's blood, saliva, and semen. Now, attention must be paid to safety, contamination, and degradation issues. Biological evidence may be detected by any of the following methods, visual inspection, alternative light source, and chemical enhancements such as luminol. And comparative evidence, that's latent fingerprints and tool marks. Now, physical evidence is basically any evidence where an object can connect a victim or a suspect to a crime scene. The evidence aids in the solution of a case provides an element of the crime and an understanding of what happened. It can even prove a theory. A physical evidence also places a suspects in contact with a victim or victims, establishes identification, can exonerate the innocent, corroborate testimony, and of course can help aid during interviews and interrogations. Now, as I mentioned back in episode one, you can go and have a little listen if you want. The widely used Lockhart's exchange principle states that every time someone enters an environment, something is added to and removed from the scene. Now, the principle is sometimes stated as every contact leaves a trace and applies to contact between individuals as well as between individuals and physical environment. Now, items of physical evidence are not always visible to the naked eye and can be easily overlooked. A methodical approach to the collection and preservation of evidence is essential. And that was episode two, so take some time, go back and have a listen. Now the exception, as I mentioned back then, is that evidence is at risk. It's important to make rapid decisions to prevent degradation or loss. Now once an item of physical evidence has been removed from the location, it must be packaged in such a way that it cannot become contaminated or damaged. Now it's equally important the item is unable to escape from its packaging as well. Firstly, that's to preserve the item from contamination from the surroundings. That's rain, mould, rust, people spitting. And secondly, it's to prevent the item contaminating other packaged evidence. Now, for example, if you had dried blood in a paper package and that wasn't secure, it could potentially get outside and then it can be transferred to anything or anyone that touched it. So some examples of how we package things. So sharp weapons such as knives are placed into a hard plastic tube, which stops them poking holes in it. And if there is blood on the object, then it is sealed with biohazard tape. Fingerprints are lifted with sticky tape, then placed onto a clear thin acetate sheet and then placed into a plastic evidence envelope. Now, depending on what you've been taught, hairs have been attached to an acetate sheet too, but sometimes, depending where they're found, they should go into a plastic bottle with a stopper and then placed into a clear polythene evidence bag. Footwear, well, that will have its whole own episode. Footwear marks should be photographed and then depending on the state of them can be lifted in a whole bunch of ways. There's casting, there's gelatin, electrostatic, and even the use of fingerprint powder. Whatever you do, it's important to keep them as still as possible. So a cardboard box is usually used for transportation. Uh, swabs come in their own tubes, and as soon as they're used, should be replaced back into that tube and taped up with biohazard tape. Items that have accelerant should be put into a nylon bag or an airtight metal container. That's to make sure that the fumes don't get out and overwhelm someone that's taking them in the car back to the DP closet. A dry clothing, shoes, etc. go into a strong paper bag. Wet evidence should be dried appropriately before bagged. Now, each package must be sealed to prevent anything getting into the package and anything getting out of it, as I said at the beginning and each package must be labelled with information that uniquely identifies it, says exactly where it's recovered, says exactly when it was recovered, 
shows the name and job of the person who recovered it and provides details of exactly who has handled the item after it has been recovered and packaged. Now, DNA recovery is a whole nother ball game, and we will cover that in another episode. But until then, please subscribe to get all the latest lessons. See you next time.